Greetings and welcome to Beyond the Bay. I am Ted Kroll and I'm here to introduce It's a Wonderful Life, which has become a perennial Christmas classic. It always was not a Christmas favorite that it is today, but as you can see by the original movie posters, the film was not presented as a Christmas film, even though in the credits there is all kinds of Christmas holiday imagery. Before discussing the film itself, let me talk about the people involved with making the film. The director was Frank Capra. This was his first Hollywood production since the end of World War II. He spent the war in the Army and made a series of well-respected educational films for soldiers called Why We Fight. Why We Fight. Capra was one of the most well-known directors in the 1930s and was looking to restart his career and he found the perfect project in It's a Wonderful Life, which fit in the subject matter of his most well-known films such as Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and Meet John Doe. In fact, the hero of Meet John Doe also contemplates committing suicide on a Christmas Eve. Capra asked James Stewart to star in the film. Stewart was also returning from the war where he was a combat pilot. Apparently, he was suffering from depression and was profoundly uncertain that he wanted to return to acting. The story goes that Lionel Barrymore told him that he needed to use his talent and it was worthwhile to return to the film industry. While they are in great conflict during the film, they were great good friends in real life. Lionel Barrymore plays Mr. Potter with a gleeful sneer. His character probably was the inspiration for Mr. Burns in The Simpsons. Notice the bust of Napoleon here. The film is filled with all kinds of little details like this. Donna Reed is the female lead and is a pleasantly softer version of Jean Arthur and Barbara Stanwyck characters that appear in Capra's earlier films. She played in several great films and won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress in from Here to Eternity in 1952. She went on with great success in her sitcom, The Donna Reed Show, to play a strong-willed housewife. Gloria Graham made her first big splash in this film. Here she has a wholesome sexiness that veers off into being a floozy in the nightmare sequence of the film. She wanted a successful career playing the same sort of character, extremely playful and sexy, but somewhat naive about it at the same time. She is a film, film noir icon. Ward Bond and Frank Fallon play Bert and Ernie. It is possible that these characters were the basis for the Bert and Ernie of Sesame Street fame. Henry Travers plays Clarence Oddbody, the second class angel. We last saw, Tra we last saw Travers in Beyond the Bay as the father in Beyond the Shadow of a Doubt. This particular shot with the clothesline dividing the frame is often noted as a way to show the difference between the divine, Clarence, and the human, George, using subtle cinematic means. Mr. Gower is played by H.B. Warner, an actor who played Jesus Christ in Cecil D. DeMille's King of Kings in the silent film era. Thomas Mitchell plays Uncle Billy, a more complex character than it first appears. He has a partner in a raven, and later a squirrel mysteriously consoles him in a scene of his breakdown. I wish we had more time to talk about this character. The raven is played by Jimmy the Raven, who appears in more than a thousand films over a 20-year career. Apparently, whenever someone called out for Jimmy on the set, both James Stewart and Jimmy the Raven would respond. Finally, an uncredited cameo appearance by the great boogie-woogie pianist Mead Lux Lewis. He is the entertainment in the bar during George's nightmare sequence. The film took an unusual path to reach its current renowned status. Capra and several other directors formed an independent production company called Liberty Films in order to make 
their own personal films without studio interference. It's a Wonderful Life was one of the two films actually made by this company. No expense was made for the production, and it cost a whopping $3 million a lot in its day. The film lost money at the box office and had mixed reviews. It was released the same year as The Best Years of Our Lives, an epic about the different difficulties faced by several men returning from the war. Best Years better suited the spirit of the American audience at the time and was a huge hit and won many Academy Awards that year. Capra's vision was out of sync with the post-war public. Also, in the red-baiting days of the time, the FBI wrote a memo that basically called It's a Wonderful Life communist propaganda because of how it portrayed Mr. Potter, the banker, as an evil force. For several reasons, the film lapsed into obscurity for decades and for all intents and purposes curtailed Capra's career. However, a miracle happened. The copyright lapsed in the 70s, which allowed TV stations to show it without paying any royalties. That is how I stumbled on it on a Sunday afternoon on a warm day in March. I had no idea what this film was about but I was captivated by its vitality and craziness. At any rate, stations across the country started showing it increasingly at Christmas, where it gained the reputation it holds today. Although nominated for five Academy Awards, the only reward it received was for special effects of the snow. Up until this picture, snow was portrayed by white covered cornflakes and gypsum, which made a lot of noise when you walked on it. Capra's crew came up with a combination of foam used in fire distinguishers with soap and water. With fans, it blew blew like real snow. This photo shows the huge set that was built for the picture. Interestingly, the film was shot in stifling 90-degree weather. While the sets and costumes cost a pretty penny, they came up with an ingenious and extremely cheap method of portraying heaven. Just a couple of stars in the heavens talking to each other. While much can be discussed about characterizing the dramatic and some say unhinged tone of the film, I will point out two characteristics of its cinematic effectiveness. There is a great deal of motion in this film. The background is often filled with people moving around, and there are lots of crowd scenes. This motion gives the film its vitality that are punctuated with full-face close-ups. The film is in perpetual motion, except for the scenes of romance between George and Mary. Also, there is a visual motif of people thrashing around in water, twice drowning, and once happily dancing away. By by the way, the swimming pool under the gym floor actually existed in the Beverly Hills High School where the dance scene was shot. So, we'll have lots to talk about this Tuesday, December 22nd at 7.30 p.m. Please join us when we discuss the classic It's a Wonderful Life.